Hey, welcome along. We have a few questions from Mark Stein Club members that we didn't get to in our last live Clubland Q&A live around the planet. Uh, so instead, of, I'm going to handle them non-live uh, because they're good questions and we don't want them to be consigned to oblivion before I get to mull over them. Uh, Mark Wolbrown. Mark Wolbrown starts by quoting Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke said, It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. Uh, Richard Mitchell said, In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and in the country of the witless, the half-wit is king. Do you think America is headed toward the latter? Uh, Halfwit may actually be pushing it. We are destroying so much, uh, whether it is uh, Kate Smith or Dr. Seuss or Stephen Foster uh, or Thomas Jefferson or William McKinley. We are mothballing so much, demolishing so much, um, that it may well be that there is not actually enough left to qualify as even half-wit. But the bit I like, I do like that Edmund Burke quote, their passions forge their fetters. When you live in a self-governing society with responsible government, where citizens elect uh, one of their own as a representative to sit in the legislature and legislate this, that, and the other, that shouldn't actually be that dramatic and exciting a thing. If you want to live a politically dramatic life, there are plenty of places to go to. You could go to Kim Jong-un's North Korea. Uh, you could go to Yemen. You could go to Sudan, where they've uh, just deposed the dictator. You could go to Libya, where functioning government uh, is basically non-existent. There's all kinds of places if you want to lead a politically exciting life. But the whole point about living in long-settled Western democracies is that politics shouldn't be exciting. Um, there's a, a great book, well worth your time reading, White by Brett Easton Ellis. And he's not any kind of conservative. He's not any kind of right-winger. He voted for Hillary Clinton, and he's gay. He's a novelist. He wrote uh, American Psycho was a monster hit, and they made a film of it and all the rest of it. And uh, Brett, Brett, Easton, I, uh, Brett Easton Ellis uh, wants to save the excitements for his fiction. So he goes along to the polling booth in November 2016, and he votes for Hillary, I don't suppose with much enthusiasm, uh, and uh, uh, Hillary loses. And so the other fellow wins, and uh, Brett Easton Ellis, is he's a... Uh, uh, gentleman of a certain age, and he's uh, living with a nice uh, young millennial fellow uh, and a nice young millennial gay guy. And the young millennial gay can't get over Trump's victory. <laughs> and uh, Brett Easton Ellis, he's driving Brett Easton Ellis nuts because Brett Easton Ellis is thinking, well, you know, there's two parties. Uh, once in a while, your party wins, uh, then the pendulum swings, the other guy's party wins, uh, but don't worry about it, the pendulum's going to swing back. And he realizes Trump's victory has driven his nice millennial twink boyfriend nuts. <laughs> and their whole, uh, uh, and placed great strain on their relationship. And by the way, this is unusual because um, normally if you meet someone who's totally wound up and they're all stressed out. And you might say to them, why don't you relax? Have a nice cup of tea. Lie down in a darkened room with a nice cup of Darjeeling, slice of lemon. If that doesn't work, uh, why not uh, go out in the town and uh, uh, blow whatever d cash you got on a couple of hookers? But that doesn't even work with Trump because Trump's put people off sex. There were psychologists explaining that their patients are coming to them and saying that ever since November... <laughs> 2016, they can no longer enjoy sexual congress because Trump being in the Oval Office has totally wrecked sex for them. The earth moved for them too much in November 2016. As Edmund Burke said, men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. 
And in the case of people with Trump derangement syndrome, their passions have forged such fetters that they can no longer even enjoy passion. Their fetters, their political obsessions, Trump, have become their only passion. Uh, and as a result, uh, just uh, lying on your back and thinking of England doesn't do it for them anymore. So this, this is absolutely correct, uh, Mark Wall Brown. You are right. And it's deeply strange. And it, and it comes in two stages. The Trump thing has moved to the next stage. Uh, usually when the, particularly with the, the left, the, the right are always idiots. So that if a fellow like Trump gets elected, it's because all the stupid people have voted. If Brexit triumphs at the polls, it's because all the stupid people have gone to the polls. Uh, and if they're not stupid, they're old and stupid, so they'll be dead soon, so you don't really have to worry about it. And this is the condescending way in which the left explains uh, its defeats. But when you take it to the next level, which is really the uh, insanity that is operating on the Democrat side over Trump, uh, you see it with what it's done to, to certain... You, you listen to Ashley Judd at that rally after tr the day after Trump's inauguration. You listen to Robert De Niro at the Tony Awards. People are trying to give Robert De Niro an award. Robert De Niro lives better than 99.99% of humanity has ever lived. But he can't get beyond Trump. Uh, his passions have forged his fetters. And it's a, it's a disturbing thing. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's not something that a healthy democratic polity uh, should really be in the business of. Toby Pilling says, have you ever seen a new political party uh, have quite as meteoric a rise as the Brexit party? Uh, no, I'm not in favor of, uh, I, as I talk, I, as I speak, I don't know how they're going to do in these European elections. Uh, but... Um, I hope they do great, uh, because they deserve to, just as a rebuke to the existing parties. And in a, what you want, I think, in a, again, in a healthy polity, uh, you, want, you want parties to be able to die and parties to be able to be born. The American system, uh, where, which has been frozen for about 150 years now, since the end of the Civil War, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans, Democrats. And, and Trump was a slight exception to that in the sense that he basically ran as an independent and governed uh, as an independent because uh, the uh, Republican House in his first two years under Paul Ryan didn't actually do anything for him, basically. Uh, that's a bit too frozen for me. Uh, then you have the opposite, which is the Italian uh, say the Italian system or the or Germany, France with Monsieur Macron's parties, where parties are coming up, coming, parties are being born, dying, born, dying all the time. And the, the uh, English speaking world, Her Majesty's Dominions, uh, as they say in law, it has always been slightly s somewhere in between that. You can launch a new party, uh, but it, you have to seed it and, and it has to take root and it has to grow. If you go, I said, what was it, end of Civil War? Um, America's had the same two parties since then. If you were to go back to that period in uh, British history, every single constituency in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales had either a liberal or a conservative member of parliament. That's all there was. Liberal, conservative, conservative, liberal. Didn't matter whether you were in Birmingham or you were in Cork or you were in Flandidno. Conservative or liberal, liberal or conservative. And usually the way the new parties work is, is uh, an issue takes root that the existing party framework uh, is too slow to address. So, for example, in the British context, you had the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, under Redmond uh, that arose in the, um, in the late 19th century uh, because that particular position... Uh, was unre otherwise unrepresented in Parliament. Since then, of course, you've had 
in a sort of approximation of it, uh, not just uh, then Northern Irish unionist political parties, Republican political parties, Scottish nationalist parties, Welsh nationalist parties, uh, even uh, then, uh, the, uh, and then most consequentially, the death of the British Liberal Party and the birth of the British Labour Party. But that happened over uh, a couple of, two or three decades. It didn't happen instantly. What, what we're seeing is unprecedented in British politics, where Nigel Farage has formed a single issue party. And he's done this for a reason, because people keep talking, because uh, the British people voted for Brexit in 2016. It's now three years later, they haven't got Brexit. And they haven't got Brexit because the same uh, lousy, clapped out, obsolete party establishment in Westminster that didn't see Brexit coming uh, decided to blame the British people for its own myopia and after the Brexit vote decided to try and prevent Brexit. And I think it's important to remember that actually Brexit shouldn't have been a political thing at all. After the, the referendum was clear enough, uh, the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. All that had to be done was for the United Kingdom to leave. So at midnight on Tuesday, the United Kingdom ceases to be a member of the European Union. And on Wednesday morning, uh, the, the UK exists in the same relationship to the European Union as any of the 170 countries or so which aren't members of the European Union. So it is then for uh, the, the post-EU UK to determine what arrangements it wishes to reach as an entirely external foreign sovereign nation with the EU, the same position that Australia is in or New Zealand's in or Fiji is in or the Solomon Islands are in. That's not a political question. That's not a political question. Um, initially, the departure from the European Union is one for the civil service. It's an apolitical civil service thing. They should have just said, uh, Britain will cease to be a European Union member on this day, uh, and that will mean that such and such will be in effect. Uh, and if you are planning uh, on vacationing, uh, taking your bird to the nude beaches of the south of France, and, uh, and lying there naked and uh, covered in armor soleil, you, you must remember now that uh, Britain isn't a member of the uh, European Union, uh, that uh, you'll have restrictions on how long you can stay uh, there, you'll be just like any other foreign country. Those are essentially matters for civil servants. The minute the decayed, decadent, useless British political class, represented by Theresa May, decided in effect to politicize Brexit as a means of using the politicization of Brexit as a subversion of Brexit, they enabled what Nigel Farage uh, is now doing. You know, people, people talk about a second referendum. In a sense, this is a second referendum. He's saying, we're the Brexit party. We, uh, we have one policy, and that is our policy is to leave the European Union, and nothing else uh, nothing else matters. We, we don't have policies on transgendered bathrooms or anything else. We're just about leaving the European Union. And if he succeeds in inflicting massive humiliation and damage on the Westminster parties, uh, then he will have done something. He will have done something extraordinary. Now, this isn't a con the British Conservative Party is no longer a Conservative Party. I don't know what it is. Uh, but you certainly do get the sense that uh, this, this is one of those moments uh, when uh, it's not just a protest vote, it's not just a flash in a pan, that the uh, political classes in Westminster have treated the electorate with such contempt that they can only be punished with the destruction of uh, their, uh, their, their party and, and the assumed security of those parties. And that's why, that's why it's unprecedented uh, 
uh, Toby. Roy Blair adds a follow-up to that. He says, what explanation do you have for the reaction of the top brass of the Conservative Party to the rise of the Brexit Party and the threatened annihilation of their own party? Gove, for example, thinks May should be given more time. May thinks it's evidence that our MP should accept her absurd deal. How can seemingly intelligent people be that stupid? I think, I think they're that stupid because they're in denial about something that happened three years ago. Uh, and I think, they're, I think they're fundamentally dishonest. And they justify their dishonesty by their condescension. They genuinely believe that they're doing their best to correct the mistake that the masses made. That, that they know better than the masses, and so they're doing the ignorant masses a favor by correcting their mistake. I don't think there's any doubt. I, I, I think that, uh, that question was clear enough. The British people voted to leave the European Union. Leaving isn't difficult unless uh, you're trying to turn your departure uh, into, in fact, some new long-term arrangement, which is where Theresa May's fundamental dishonesty comes in. All these people, by the way, disgust me, absolutely disgust me, because I didn't mind all the slimy duplicitousness of David Cameron and these other Weasley types for decades over the European Union, because they hadn't actually put themselves out there and asked a direct question and got a direct answer. History will be withering uh, in its contempt uh, for Mrs. May and Co. Nicola Timmerman. Uh, Right, couldn't, uh, it's Victoria Day, and I was wondering if you would uh, bring up the shameful closing to the public of the recently dedicated memorial to those Canadian soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan. Publicity about the memorial only came three days after the dedication, and no family members of slain soldiers were invited. In other words, to see the memorial honoring their loved ones, they have to make an appointment with uh, the uh, Department of Defense uh, and go to the bureaucracy's building and see the appoint and see the memorial inside the building. And we all know what the truth of this is, Nicola. That if you Canada has taken so many. Uh, Afghan refugees and so many excitable uh, young men of a particular confessional persuasion that if you were to put an Afghan memorial next to, say, the Cenotaph, uh, the war memorial in Ottawa, which has already been attacked, um, then you would be, in effect, opening a target for excitable young men of a particular religious persuasion to blow up. And Canada is governed by cowards. So those cowards have decided that the way they will honor the Canadian soldiers who died in Afghanistan, and Canadian forces have been in there from day one, that's almost 18 years now, uh, and they have uh, fought very bravely. They were, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry were some of the best snipers ever in Afghanistan, broke world records for picking off jihadist scum at incredibly long ranges. And uh, President Bush wanted to honor them, well, I think the Silver Star from the Pentagon or whatever, and uh, Monsieur Chrétien, the Prime Minister, wanted to hush that up because he didn't want it getting about that Canadian soldiers still actually killed the enemy. So Canadians have fought long and hard in Afghanistan, and instead they have this furtive, embarrassed, shameful memorial, non-memorial. Because it's like if you go to the headquarters of any security service, spies, spies. So if you go to uh, MI6 headquarters or CIA headquarters or the like, and deep inside the building there'll be a wall with names on. And the reason they do that is because in order not to break the cover of these spies and endanger the lives of contacts around the world, assets around the world whom they knew, they have to keep it all hushed up and quiet. Uh, that's the reason they have indoor memorials. You don't do indoor memorials for soldiers who die fighting for queen and country in the uniform of their country 
that's something entirely alien to Canada. And the reason it's important, it's important not just for Canada, but for America and the rest of the West, is that this is actually, they're now doing to the present what they've done to the past. You know, so, for example, in America, we've seen all these things where people have been uh, taking down statues of Robert E. Lee and other Confederate generals and other problematic figures. And they're saying, no, 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 we're not destroying them. We're just removing them from the public square, from the public space, and taking them to sub-basement three in a museum. But you'll still be able to go and see this part of our history in sub-basement level three of the National Museum of Haters and Racists. And there's something completely despicable about doing that to brave soldiers in a war that is still being fought. And we know why they're doing this. As I said, it's an act of cowardice. But the cowardice is doubled. Monsieur Trudeau was at that disgraceful summit uh, held in France recently with the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the President of France and other people, the post-Christchurch massacre thing, where they're all uh, saying they're pledged to commit to crack down on hatred and to shut down hate speech on the internet and shut down this and shut down that uh, to prevent any Christchurch happening again. But we know why they're not putting the Afghanistan memorial out in public. Because Trudeau is scared. And he's scared of these people in a way that he's not scared of, you know, either the last nonagenarian Nazi party member uh, living in a, uh, a trailer out in Saskatchewan somewhere, nor is he trained about, uh, scared of some neo-Nazi uh, tweeting and Instagramming from his mum's basement. Uh, where, what he has done for this Afghan war memorial tells you who he's, uh, who he's really uh, scared of. Um, <laughs> all, uh, we have uh, Dominic, who's just joined the Mark Stein Club from Australia. Lovely to have you with us, Dominic. Uh, thrilled about that. He says, in about 2010 to 2012, you wrote a lot about the national debt in America and elsewhere. Almost a decade on, and there's been no reversal of this debt mountain, and in fact, it's increased. Even in Australia, which famously paid down its government debt to zero, debt has now crept up to 41% of GDP. Is there any hope at all to reverse this anywhere before Western countries turn into Venezuela? Well, America, is a great, America can't be Venezuela because it controls the currency in which the debt is denominated in. And in that sense, I suppose the better comparison is Zimbabwe. Uh, because in Zimbabwe, uh, when you beggar your uh, nation's economy, as Robert Mugabe did, the problem for that is you borrowed the money in American dollars and you have to pay it back in American dollars. And in the meantime, your own currency has become utterly worthless. And uh, America has an advantage in that sense in that it controls the U.S. dollar. And occasionally clever clogs economists say, uh, why, why, why don't, uh, I, I think this was Paul Krugman's proposal. Uh, it was rather like the, the uh, old uh, uh, comedy about the, um, the one million pound note. Uh, that you, you never need to spend any money because no one can ever break your one million pound note, so the tailor makes your suit for free and all the rest of it. Paul Krugman's proposal was that America should actually just issue a $100 trillion note <laughs> and all would be well. And uh, there's a certain element of truth in that because uh, I used to say 10 years ago that um, America had to pay back whatever it was back then, uh, uh, $18 trillion just to get back to being broke, which no one in world history has ever done. It had to pay back $18 trillion just to get back to having nothing in its pocket. No one's ever done that in human history. No one in, 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 in the history of this planet has ever paid back that amount of money. Well, now it's whatever it is, 20-something trillion dollars, and no one has ever paid that up. And when you look in the eyes, it's fascinating to me, Go and look in the eyes of politicians in Washington. It doesn't matter, Democrat or Republican, say, well, uh, I saw you gave a speech in uh, Indiana somewhere that you said we need to get spending under control. Um, so actually, what plans do you have for paying down the debt? 
You know, normally uh, people with large amounts of debt have debt repayment plans. You know that if you owe the bank $5,000, they get a little antsy about it. So they want to know what plans you have for reducing it to $4,000 and $3,000 and $2,000 and eventually paying it off. The bank's very interested to know that when you owe $5,000. Uh, and instead, where well, you have a situation, in fact, again, the old joke. Uh, the old joke used to be that uh, if you owe the bank $1,000, you have a problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank has a problem. If you owe the world $25 trillion, the world has a problem. Uh, and yet, uh, the general view in America and throughout the rest of the West Living lives uh, that, uh, uh, and enjoying uh, the benefits of government largesse that is not paid for, that the, the, the economic laws can be suspended indefinitely. And we will think they're suspended indefinitely until we hear a faint rumbling sound and realize that's our entire civilization going off the cliff. Thank you for that question, Dominic. Uh, we have got from passions forging our fetters, uh, but in massive unprecedented levels of debt, there is unending license. So we brought it full circle, kind of. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Sorry we didn't get to all of them. We'll do it next time, either on Clubland Q&A or Mark's Mailbox. See you then.